Welcome to Who Moves You. My guest today is Tim Hudak. Tim is the CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association. His leadership has helped to position ARIA among the top real estate associations in North America on matters of education, ethics, professional standard, and it has helped to put Ontario realtors at the forefront with tools and technology we have access to that enable us to bring the best services to the public for buying and selling real estate. Prior to taking the reins at ARIA five years ago, Tim served as a provincial legislator for 21 years, during which time Tim had a fundamental role in the creation of the province's Real Estate and Business Brokers Act, REBA, and in the creation and launch of the Real Estate Council of Ontario, RICO. Tim's time in politics culminated with his role as the leader of the Ontario Conservative Party. He is a father of two beautiful daughters, Miller and Maitland. Also worthy of note, Tim is a master of the backyard grill. How are you today, Tim? <laughs> That's a great intro. Thanks. Quite like, the setup. I'm doing great. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Well, it's great to be on your podcast. Who moves you? Who well, moves the who you? Moves me. The, the who gets me excited. Okay. Uh, Peter Gabriel also moved me a lot. And, and Feel the Dreams with Kevin Costa. That one makes me cry. Oh yeah, it's always got a. It's a yeah. great movie. It's that's one night when it you you flip by it on a Saturday, like you know, I'll just watch a few minutes of it and you end up watching the the rest of the whole yeah. movie. It's one of those. Uh, and I've known you now going back to your past political life, and of course with your time at Aria these past few years. And I've wondered when the CEO position with Aria presented itself. Aside from knowing you were abundantly qualified. Were there other things that attracted you to the job and to working in our real estate industry? Yeah, look, I really appreciate the question. Now, you and I are cut from a similar cloth, eh? The interest in real estate, the interest in politics and public mm -hmm. life, public affairs. And that's actually a great thing I've, I've found about realtors because uh, good realtors are always so involved in the community, yeah. awesome volunteers. They got to know what's going on. There is usually a strong connection in, in skills and personalities. And we're trying to get even more realtors to run for public office. There's a bit of... Yeah, that cross pollination, I guess, uh, oh, going from run, totally. one career over to the other. There, you're working with people. You're out in the public. Yeah, and you know, some some politicians, you know, because they bought maybe one or two houses and they think they're experts. But if you really want to have best decision making when it comes to uh, to real estate, getting more realtors at municipal office, provincial yeah. and national is one of our goals. But let me get back to your question. So yeah, I, I had uh, just had stepped down as leader of the Ontario PC Party. I wanted to win that election. I got close, mm -hmm. but I didn't have two thousand votes or so. Yeah. Uh, to get across the finish line. So after 21 years, it's time to pass the baton. And uh, But because I'd been in politics, politics since I was 27, I really wanted something that motivated me. Like my feet mm -hmm. you know, hit the ground in the morning and I got out of bed. I was going to be on a mission that meant something. And when right. I heard about the area job coming open and you know, being there to help uh, those who help Ontarians get the keys for their first home, right? To, to yeah. be a champion of that Canadian dream of home ownership meant a lot. Luckily, mm -hmm. I had a lot of experience, you said, with the RIA, but when I heard the job was open, I threw my hat in the ring right away and hope for the best. Well, we're the better for it. Uh, and I, I, I hope uh, the past, it's been five years now, I guess. I hope they've been exciting. Certainly giving you opportunity to sit down with some interesting people at events. I mean, who'd ever guess you'd be sitting down with the former uh, president of the United States and, and chit-chatting. I mean, uh, uh, been a lot of fun uh, uh, and a lot of hard work for sure. Yeah. yeah, it's I mean it's flown by. You're exactly right. I'm in my fifth year now, but you know a lot of accomplishments uh, together. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I love the fact that uh, realtors are are naturals in advancing advocacy issues. That they've done a fantastic job. I think they've gone since COVID crisis of looking mm -hmm. out for the community and their clients. You know, putting the public benefit uh, yeah. ahead of business has really shone yeah. through this crisis. All in all, yeah, it's for been, sure, it's been tremendously uh, rewarding time and. I think this is from uh, from hitting home and being on your uh, your podcast. And I think I've made about five mm -hmm. appearances with you. So that's been the true uh, highlight. And George, that well, of course. Uh, yeah, come on. The, the, this this is what made you a household name for sure. Precisely. <laughs> but uh, be back. Yes. Well, thank you. And uh, we are living in interesting times for sure right now. And uh, certainly, the real estate industry has seen changes in the past years or in the past year resulting from the pandemic, but. Not the changes that I would have predicted. Uh, the media bubble, or media loves to call the current activity in the market a bubble, I should say. And uh, they're saying it's bound to crash. But 
they've been saying that on similar things since I started in the business 20 years ago. What, what are your thoughts on bubble thing that the media keeps talking about? Uh, look, uh, bad, bad news uh, gets around the world before good news gets its pants on is the old expression, yeah. right? So yeah. people, um, for whatever reason, uh, click more likely on bad news than you like to drive that story. True. But you know, unlike what happened in the States back in 2008, um, the fundamentals here are, are very, very strong. Mortgage rates uh, remain, you know, near record lows. For You've sure. got a generation of boomers who are passing on inheritance to their, their kids to look in the home market. People have actually saved money, those that kept their jobs, right? We've got the COVID haves and the COVID have-nots. We have right. to worry about the have-nots, get them back to work. But for the haves, They've been able to stock up more in savings. So they're putting that now towards uh, down payments uh, on a home. And, and mm-hmm. like you and I know that through these crises, there's one thing that's been abiding, the importance of, of home ownership. It's a place of safety and security. That's been yeah. reinforced or tripled during COVID to keep us safe, but yeah. also as a smart long-term investment. With immigration, we'll open up again once we get through this. Those fundamentals on the demand side are very strong. So no surprise, we've seen a lot of interest in real estate. Yes, for sure. And uh, the search for affordability seems to be the predominant reason that so many right now are pushing out beyond the GTA with their home hunting. I mean, Aria released, you released a white paper, and that's what we're going to talk a bit about today is uh, highlighting real estate trends that we're seeing in Ontario. And in it, they lay out some actions and policy suggestions that focus on how communities can prepare for and meet the needs of a rising and expanding population in the province. Did did you have a role in putting this, this report together? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it was an issue that's near and dear to my heart Mm -hmm. um, when I was in my old job in in politics and now in, in the new job, because as you know, Mike, I I visited you a few times in, uh, in Barrie, you know, part of my job is to get out of the office, travel across our province to visit our real estate boards and our brokerages in small towns as well as large. And you really saw a, a tale of two different cities. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, between uh, over the last 10 years, 87% of the jobs in our province were created either in Toronto uh, or in Ottawa. Many of our smaller wow. communities, now not Barry, but many of our smaller communities actually shrank. They lost jobs, particularly good paying jobs in manufacturing. They had social decline. So while yeah. some areas around here were doing really well, there was part that was falling behind desperately. So mm-hmm. our resident volunteers on our GR committee and our staff said, let's put some ideas on the table to help kickstart growth again, to bring jobs yeah. back to small town Ontario, Northern Ontario, to bring more affordable housing options to those communities as well. Like how do we actually help them share in the benefits of the Ontario economy? So it's not all in the big city. Right. But we began that work before COVID. As a result of COVID, I'm feeling very positive about the ideas we have mm-hmm. and more optimistic that we're poised for a small town comeback. Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's reaching the eyeballs who need to see this. And uh, we keep pushing that direction. It couldn't be more timely. And I thought we could go through some of the recommendations within the report together. Uh, in the, the paper, Aria Mech recommends the creation of opportunity zones by the federal and provincial governments. Tell us a bit about what that is and what that would entail. Yeah, exactly. You know, all this is focused on more economic opportunity and in communities that have been left behind in the past. An opportunity zone is one of the few things, one of the very few things that actually unites Democrats and Republicans south of the border. They agree on it. Right. They're using it in the United Kingdom. So here's mm-hmm. how we're working on Ontario. Say you've got a community that um, has lost its main, its main job producer, manufacturing site, something in resources, and right. as a result of social decline, a lack of tax base. Or maybe it's an older industrial community, and there's mm-hmm. a big brownfield in the middle of town. The government could say, we'll call that an opportunity zone. You lower taxes, you speed up approvals, you waive fees to attract new employers. It's been a Mm -hmm. huge success in the States and the UK. We believe it can be here too. And as you attract those new jobs, along with it, you can attract more housing opportunities for those workers. And and there's a place at the table for all three levels of government, I would think, too, municipal, provincial, and federal. For Absolutely. Incentives. And, you know, because we're a provincial association, we're working with the yeah. province, but part of it's federal. And, you know, we had success in the recent Ontario budget. They, they took part of that idea. And now there's a, an increased tax credit if you make a commercial reinvestment. You buy an old building, industrial mm-hmm. commercial, you fix it up. I forget what it is now, but yeah. I think it's over $50,000 in tax benefits back to encourage wow. it. So the province liked their idea. 
So they started down that path. I say, keep going. Yeah. And there's a few buildings that fit that category right here in, in my hometown here, Barry. And another suggestion is to create an office relocation strategy to review eligible bureaucracies and agencies that can be moved outside of the urban core to rural and Northern Ontario. This is something I've been in favor of for as long as I've been a realtor as there's such a concentration and, and rightfully so when these agencies were all created, they needed to be, uh, you know, close to one another physically, uh, that needs not, not as great anymore. Talk yeah. a little bit about how that might unfold. Yeah, you bet. This is, um, where my two worlds came together. This is something I yeah. used to champion when I was in office coming from, you know, Niagara and some smaller towns there in Fort Erie. And, and now we're doing it from a real estate point of view. Well, I always wondered as did our, you know, realtor volunteers, like why is the Ontario government and also the feds, you know, the biggest landowners in the city of Toronto? where the most expensive yeah. real estate is. And if mm -hmm. you work in Toronto, you have to pay them more. So why wouldn't you look to relocate some of those uh, large bureaucracies and put them in smaller communities, whether that's Barrie or Niagara Falls, or mm -hmm. you could also then use some of that money that you make from that to reinvest in services like new transit and new highways. And what's happened now because of uh, work from home uh, and COVID, you know, more workers are saying, hey, I could live in a smaller community, save on mm -hmm. my housing costs, and still do the government job. So this policy becomes even more attractive. The last right. element too, if the province downsizes its footprint through work from home or relocating offices, um, they've got real estate they can sell off in the larger cities to help put towards more housing options. Affordable so, housing, yeah. You got it, yeah. So it's a really yeah. checks off all those boxes. I really hope the Ford government would go down this path or any of the political parties. It's it's a win-win for sure for government and for, you know, for the city and for rural regions. And uh you know, satellite high-speed broadband internet creating opportunities uh, and just opening up the entire province. Uh, really, uh, soon enough, we're going to have it everywhere, and it'll be great. It'll be great for native communities. It's going to be great for remote hospitalization. Our top recommendations is to invest in broadband. Like in the turn of the century, last time around, into the 19th, the province engaged with electrification. So they took electricity and spread it out to the smaller communities. And that had right. a revolutionary impact on small towns. The yeah. so modern version is broadband, high-speed internet. And Mike, I'm sure you're getting this to the areas you cover. Our realtors yep. are saying, top question I get is no longer in smaller towns. Like, How many doctors do you have? How's the internet service? And yeah. you know, our lobbying efforts actually had success in the budget here again with, I almost feel like uh, Dr. Evil saying this, but a billion dollars was announced <laughs> in the provincial budget. Big difference for those smaller communities. Yeah, for sure. And uh, increasing natural gas expansion projects is another component of that too, is it not? Or... Yep, hand, hand yeah. in hand. The broadband and natural gas we see as modern infrastructure. Electrification are just like when we built the 400 series of highways. And, mm -hmm. you know, imagine Barry, if they didn't have the 400, so too, this is modern infrastructure to encourage growth. Um, while natural gas is considered pretty common in urban areas, in many small towns, it's a luxury. It helps reduce your heating costs. It helps reduce your appliance costs. You can save a few bucks. And also it can open up new job opportunities for business manufacturing and also for the agriculture sector. Again, the province has made good steps in this direction. Yeah. And uh, there's uh, reforms to accelerate the conversion of commercial properties into mixed use residential sites. Great potential there. So many smaller communities have that leftover infrastructure from our industrial heyday. Um, so there would be a, a push for financial incentives to, to convert that, as you kind of touched on. Yeah, and for sure. Uh, and also, I think on changing zoning rules. Sometimes our zoning yes. laws are put in place in the 70s. We act like they're, you know, the Bible and you can't change it. Um, yeah. I think we do have to modernize that to get more flexibility because of work from home, probably a shift in retail state that there may be some commercial vacancies. So why not look to convert some of those to housing uh, or mixed use residential commercial? And that's very affordable for first time home buyers or downsizers. I can see opportunities there. And I'd also add that, you know, subsidies for urban brownfield reclamation. I think first time you and I ever talked in an interview I, I i touched on that you're still in politics uh, uh and and i think it's not just the funding i i, I look at that and i think there's got to be a, a more uh, economically viable way to deal with this at the provincial level uh involving the municipalities and we're just not there uh and i think you see so many properties just sitting vacant in most towns 
and prime land. And that's the holdup is it's going to cost millions of dollars to, to remediate the soil. So it just sits there. So you got uh, it. Hope, and a lot yeah. of the land already serviced too, right? It's yeah. in the ground. It's not being utilized. Yeah. So let's take advantage of that. Maybe it's housing, maybe it's jobs. Another point here was the Ontario government should embrace and enable micro credential programs offerings at provincial posts, secondary institutions, specifically those that have satellite campuses in rural and northern, northern Ontario. Let's talk a little about that. Yeah, there's a growing expectation in the post-secondary education community uh, that people want micro-credentials. So that's mm-hmm. not necessarily, you know, what you know you and I did to go for your three or four year um, degree at a college or university right. and stay in that town where you'll get different skills and then you can stack them up towards a degree or a specialty. And mm-hmm. because of the investments, you know, we hope to see in broadband, our experience with work from home, which will mean more education from home, for some it's by COVID, but it worked out pretty well. Why don't we allow more micro-credentials for colleges, universities, okay. or other educational institutions so you develop the skill, work towards a degree, but you can do it from your home. And that yeah. means a lot of folks who previously left the small town, gone to the big city to school and then stay in the big city, and they can stay in that small town if they so choose. Yeah, and and Ontario has done a pretty good job, I would think, of of placing their post secondary education institutions throughout the province. You get into northern Ontario Lakelands, there's so many opportunities. You not you don't. There probably was a time where if you wanted a post secondary education, you had no choice but to go to Ottawa or Toronto or Hamilton. Uh, uh, it's not the case anymore, I guess. And we talked touched on this too. Is you know immigration's a little bit on hold for the moment, but it. It will be back, and it's certainly one of the bigger stimulants for our entire economy and uh, programs to encourage wider settlement of new Im- immigrants. Because typically, I know if I was going to be moving to Russia, I'd probably want to find that community of English-speaking people uh, in Moscow somewhere and and live there and maybe never move from there. But we can create incentives to, to spread uh, or encourage immigration uh, to disperse to more rural regions. How would that work? Exactly. Russia, though, would eh? that be your top choice? <laughs> just team? popped, came to mind. No, probably something something warmer. Uh, just watched a program on it last night. But uh, There you go. My daughter, yeah. who's, uh, you mentioned Miller, is 13, and she's like infatuated with Russia. Talk about Russia all the time. She likes the Russian dance and gymnasts and all this stuff. Yeah. So I hear a lot about Russia. We're not moving there. No, um, it's fascinating yeah. history, for sure. <laughs> but you're right, Mike. I, Mike, I think my own, my own family, the Hudak family, um, initially moved to Toronto before moving mm-hmm. to Sarnia. And they did that because the Slovak community was there. They're adapting to a new country. That's mm-hmm. the tradition. But there are government yeah. programs, for example, that allow people to move forward faster in the immigration line when the doors are open again, who yeah. are entrepreneurs, who are, are going to create a number of jobs or invest. And you mm-hmm. can have a level to enable that to happen and move faster in the smaller community. So if somebody wanted to you know, start a new business in, in Timmins uh, or in Bracebridge, right? You can yeah. give them a faster pass on the immigration side uh, and in return, you know, creating jobs for people who need them in our province. Yeah, it would be great. And another thing is incentivizing recent graduates. Uh, and that would include immigrants as well as, uh, you know, uh, Canadians who have been here for, for a longer period of time to move to rural and northern Ontario in order to reverse the brain drain that we see. You know, kids, that's right. get, get that's your that's ticket right. and you go to Toronto because that's where the big jobs are. The government yeah, jobs. Brain, the brain drain was one of the, you know, big strains the past 10, 15 years, particularly for small communities where a lot of that mm-hmm. educated talent would go to cities and stay. So when we yeah. did our survey and our research uh, at ARIA, we found a number of states, including Kansas, had a program that rewarded uh, students to come back to their small towns. So we put it mm-hmm. in a report as one of our uh, 15 recommendations. And by the way, I should have said this earlier, if people want to read the whole report, it's called Small Towns big opportunities and they can read it at orea orea.com and we have mm-hmm. a meeting with government officials on these things quite regularly to say um this is going to help uh help bring back jobs bring back right. people and more affordable housing and, and it will attract those key dot com and tech industries to those regions i mean you you look out kitchener waterloo because of the education programs they have there those companies have gravitated you know like blackberry and so many others that are out there I'd love to see some of that industry come to Barrie, but the reality is our uh, brain drain is going to the South. So there, that's where they typically want to be. So it would be interesting to see a reversal. How about a, a streamlining and easing of red tape for various types of development approvals? Nobody's going to argue with you on that. Is that something we can achieve? 
I think we're actually uh, heading in the right direction finally uh, on this. So I'm afraid there's more to be done, but uh, ARIA worked with the province on what's called a More Homes, More Choice Act. It's probably the most pro-home ownership legislation that passed in the assembly that we've seen in, in a generation. Big focus mm-hmm. of that, Mike, is to you know knock down some of these red tape barriers, slow down development, slow down yes. housing choice. In some regions, not too far from you, I think York region, you have to pay up to $140,000 in taxes and fees and permits for the shovel hits the ground. Who ends up paying that, right? It's the first time home buyer yeah. trying to get in the marketplace. So we talked a lot here about how to spur economic development and job creation throughout mm-hmm. our province. But we also want to make sure people have places to live. I mean, growing up in a small town, I mean, you're the same way I think in Barrie, like the average person would always inspire to say, I want to be able to afford a home in the neighborhood I grew up in. But that's getting harder and harder even in small towns. So mm-hmm. by speeding up the housing approval process, lowering red tape and fees, then we can make sure that there are affordable places for people to call home in those communities too. Another recommendation is the elimination of the existing rural growth plan. Now, are we talking about the Places to Grow Act uh, that came in well, 2005, I believe? Basically part yeah. of that. It's um, a 16-year-old uh, policy now that's time-stamped. It's, it's dated. A lot of things have changed since then. Uh, yeah. For sure. It's an excellent point. And, you know, the concern with that was it was kind of a, a one-size-fits-all straitjacket. Good intentions of making sure mm-hmm. we could manage growth, but it basically kind of envisions the whole province as like a bit of a young and Eglinton. And if you want young and Eglinton, you can live there. But, you know, Barry might have his different culture. Uh, Fort Erie would have a different culture. So this gives more flexibility to our local councils to help yeah. design the communities that they think fits with the local culture and to provide for more growth for areas that want it. That's yeah. what that recommendation. Yeah. And, and, and I think the public, the public in general, uh, you know, constituents, they, they don't want to see willy nilly growth uh, over the top. They, they're a good barometer and monitor for the, the type of uh, building that's going to happen. We don't need it to come from the provincial level, from, you know, bureaucrats who probably don't spend much time in Barry and don't know what our boots on the ground needs are here at Barry. So I'd like to see that happen more and see things move a little quicker. And, uh, um, we talk about the Ontario government developing a rent-to-own program for affordable units in the non-GTHA to promote greater access to housing and encourage worker retention and provide an affordable alternative for would-be home buyers. Yeah, and I mean, this is your business, so tell me if I'm mm-hmm. right, but what I hear from a lot of realtors is that it's not really the mortgage payments that are the issue, the obstacle yeah. to first-time buyers or move-up buyers. It's, it's getting the money for the down payment in the first yeah. place to get into the market. So there's some yep. really cool new property technologies that we mm-hmm. think we could work with to enable people to get the keys to their first home. It kind yeah. of resembles the old rent to own with a big dose of modern technology. So I'll, I'll give you an example. There's some new technologies starting in the States, some starting here in, in Ontario that will give you the financing for that down payment. They become co-owners in the home and you okay. can you know, pay them out over time or they get a share in some of their models when you sell the home down the road of the returns as co-owners. Um, others okay. will be a loan and you pay them back over time like the old rent to own. Mm-hmm. We have seen the federal government bring a program in like that where the government mm-hmm. is the co-investor. Now that's yeah. not been as successful, I think, because it's too narrow and not realistic numbers. In the United Kingdom, there are pensions that want to have long patient returns. So home ownership fits that are helping people buy homes. This is a, a, a really groundbreaking opportunity mm-hmm. to help people finance their down payment to get into mm-hmm. the first home and then pay it off over time. Yeah. And I think in a, a more targeted way, that's what Habitat for Humanity has been doing yeah. for, for some time. Am I right? Yeah. It's but, exactly uh, right. And, and they're targeted yeah. and, and we work with them through a realtor care foundation. They're, they're a charity. And this would bring that same kind of opportunity to more people in the middle class. And given where housing prices are in that high entry level bar that, that's there with the prices we have, the likelihood is that prices are going to continue to go higher. My worry is we've created a class or a segment of the population that that's always going to be renters, like like Manhattan, where most of the population rents. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think with the high price of real estate uh, that we have, uh, do you think there'll ever be a time where those at the lower end of that who are struggling the most will have better access to Ontario real estate? Or is it always going to be uh, a widening gap? 
Well, I, I really hope we can stop this widening gap. And, and I am optimistic, Mike, we make the right choices, like a lot of things that we talked about today. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the great success stories in Canada has been that every generation has had a better chance at owning a home than their parents did. And that has been true since Confederation, through the wars, even through the Depression, through the 70s, all of that, until about mm -hmm. six years ago. And then it went downhill for the first time ever. The fact that Canada has been successful in that meant that we had a strong middle class. We weren't stratified with only the rich and the poor. The middle class has been the strength of prosperity and peace in Canada. It's made us the envy of the world. Yeah. And I'm worried that's going to start slipping away. That's why we've mm -hmm. invested so much time as a realtor association saying, how can we help create that next generation of Ontario homeowners? Yeah. We're not Manhattan, right? We're not, you know, Vancouver surrounded by a mountain and an ocean. We mostly yeah. have a mountain and ocean of regulation, and red tape and restrictions. We have lots of space both above current builds and now through this paper to create more growth in smaller communities too, so we can get back on track and have more homeowners in our province. No, this is great. And it's a good note to, to wrap that up on. And, and I just want to add one more point is, well, we're now into another stay at home order. We're going to, are we going to make it to that vaccination or that point where all of us or the majority of us are vaccinated before we see our economy tank or things, things turn bad? I mean, for, for up until now, uh, things have, have moved along. I'm quite proud to say our industry has done well. The public in general has persevered, but there's, there's got to be limits at some point. Do you think we're close to those limits or do you think we're going to get through this? It's like a roller coaster, right? But I think we're coming yeah. close to the end of the ride. It's not a ride yeah. you want to be on, but no. it has ups and downs. Um, yeah. And I think realtors can play a big role here in encouraging people to get vaccinated. Realtors always stay in touch with you know what's happening in the community. Yeah. Because sometimes communities might have 50 plus, 55 plus. It's moving at a different pace. So I'd love to encourage you know all of the folks that are um, watching the podcast here today to get the word out on how people can get vaccinated and get through it. And we have ideas like we talked about. Well, real estate has persevered <clears throat> through this crisis. Other areas have not. But we believe fundamentally real estate can be those jumper cables on the rest of the economy to get more yes. people back to work and on payroll again. Excellent. And on that, Tim, I, I will thank you for your time today and for your insights and your knowledge. It's been great. And look forward to having you back. My pleasure. Uh, great being okay. on uh, uh, Who Moves You? Mike, great seeing you again. Thank you for all the work that you're doing <laughs> yep. on Gary and Simcoe to advocate for these important issues like homeownership and our economy, keep you safe. Thanks so much, Tim.